and welcome everybody uh, to the Say Gay Plays Roundtable. My name is Amelia Parento and I will be your moderator for today's conversation. I use she, her pronouns and I am joining this call from Washington DC on the unceded ancestral lands of the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples. I would like to open today's conversation with a land acknowledgement to pay respect to the elders past and present who have stewarded the lands we are all joining today's call from. This land acknowledgement serves to demonstrate the power in naming and to honor the traditional historic relationship native inhabitants have with the land all over the present day United States. Colonization is an ongoing process and acknowledging the brutal systemic mistreatment, abuse and exploitation generations of native peoples have experienced is just a first step in restoring justice. As we hold space for the LGBTQ plus community in today's conversation, let us remember the interconnected legacies of oppression and violence that undergird our country's past and present. At this time, I would like to invite our audience members to say hello and contribute their own personal land acknowledgement by using the chat. If you're not sure whose land you're joining today's call from, we'll share a resource in the chat to help you begin your own research. While you are introducing yourselves, I'll share some guidelines for today's conversation. Thank you, Christina. This discussion is scheduled to last for approximately one hour. Closed captions are available for this conversation in the box located beneath the video player on your screen. If you have to leave early, an archival video of today's conversation will be made available on the same page. If you're experiencing technical difficulties or if you have an access need, please let us know in the chat and we will do our best to help you. If you have a question, also, please feel free to drop that in the chat. We will hold space for questions in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour, and we encourage you to please submit any and all questions via the chat box. Finally, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to the HowlRound TV team, particularly Thea Rogers and Emily Ferris, for all of your help in making today's event possible. I would also like to acknowledge our Zoom operator, Christina Varshevskaya, who has been an invaluable part of the Say Gay Plays project and is making sure everything runs smoothly behind the scenes for us today. Thank you so much, Christina. With all that said, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Wayne Moggins, the founding artistic director of Voyage Theatre Company, who will share the origin story of the Say Gay Plays. Wayne? Thank you, Amelia, for that introduction. And uh, thank you again to Hal Round for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Wayne Moggins. I use he, him pronouns. I am the founding artistic director of Voyage Theater Company, which is celebrating its 10th year anniversary this year. Um, most of our work for the past 10 years has been in the realm of international theater, plays in translation, and new works with social justice themes. Um, at the beginning of 2022, we were just starting to think about what to do for our 10th anniversary season. We knew that it should be an opportunity to do some fundraising for our company, but our board president, Michael No, um, who, full disclosure, is also my life partner, um, kept saying he wanted to do something to give back. Artists giving back became his mantra. And then over dinner, one evening with our colleague Stephanie Clapper, Stephanie floated the idea of short plays. We'd never done short plays before, but um, it seemed to be a good way to include a lot of artists and uh, we could include them in a single event or a single season. It seemed like um, a great way to mark 10 years of work. So I was mulling all of this over when in March of 2022, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed the Parental Rights and Education Bill, which came to be known as the Don't Say Gay Law. Now, among the many insidious things that this bill does is to limit speech and restrict what can and cannot be discussed between teachers and students. It prohibits classroom discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity. It also requires schools to notify parents 
of any healthcare services students receive. And it authorizes parents to bring legal action against school districts who fail in any of these areas. So the Don't Say Gay bill threw public education in Florida into a frenzy. Librarians were forced to pull books off of shelves. Queer teachers could no longer talk about themselves or their families. It was basically lighting a match to fire up the culture wars. And then the rhetoric really ramped up. Lawmakers across the country began introducing similar bills. There were at least 84 bills introduced in 26 states in the following 12 months alone. 84 bills, 26 states in one year. On June 6, 2023, last Pride, Human Rights Campaign officially declared a state of emergency for LGBTQ people in the United States for the first time in their more than 40 year history. Mm, happy Pride. Groups like Moms for Liberty and Parents Defending Education began gaining momentum. The campaign to take back our schools spread across the country. They were staging protests at school board meetings. Um, there's, there's, there's been an unprecedented surge in book bannings. Right-wing activists began accusing teachers of being pedophiles and librarians of being groomers. And I think that's when it hit me. That language triggered something in me personally, those words pedophile, groomer. As a survivor of childhood sexual abuse by a public school educator who was also an evangelical Christian, I can tell you firsthand that what creates an environment for sexual predators is not open and honest conversation about sexuality. Predators thrive in a climate of secrecy and shame. So closing down all conversation around gender and sexuality is a surefire way of enabling sexual predators. Stigmatizing LGBTQ people as somehow being evil and wrong doesn't get children out of harm's way. It puts them at much greater risk. These laws have real and severe consequences for young people, especially young queer people who are already among the most vulnerable. So that's when I had the idea for Say Gay Plays. And um, the name seems so obvious, I was sure that somebody else was already doing it. But as I looked out towards our national community of theater makers, I wasn't seeing any kind of unified response. Everybody was still struggling to regain their footing after the pandemic. Audiences weren't back yet, there was no money. And of course, there are and still are great companies all over the country who are doing really good queer theater. It just, it seemed to be happening in silos. And I was yearning for something that was more unified, a show of solidarity from our community, taking a stand against this tidal wave of bigoted anti-gay legislation. So I thought, well, somebody has to do this. I knew this was a moment for collective theater action. And I knew of some other similar projects that had been done over the years. There was one around gun control. Um, there was another one on Prop 8. There was Row 2.0, which sadly is needed now more than ever again. Um, but I knew it was going to be a heavy lift. And it was something that we as a company had never done. We'd never done anything like what I was imagining. So. I was a little afraid and a little scared to pull the trigger on it. Then in July of 2023, I was having a, a meeting with my NYU classmate, Moises Kaufman. Um, Moises, as you know, is someone who has done some not insignificant work on this particular topic. And I thought, well, if Moises thinks this is a good idea, maybe it's a good idea. So over lunch, I told him my ideas for Say Gay Plays, and um, Moises looked at me and he said, oh, thank God, I was afraid you were going to ask me for something I couldn't get behind, but this is essential. 
you must do this. Put me on your board, I will help. And then as we were leaving the restaurant, uh, Moises turned to me uh, with this wide grin and he said, dream big. So there was no turning back. And so here we are. Uh, we have 10 brand new short plays by queer writers that tell stories about love, family, humanity, and what we all share in common. They're beautifully crafted, funny, and engaging stories that we invite you to share with your community as a way to come together and stand in solidarity against hate. I'll pass it back to Amelia. Thank you so much, Wayne. Thank you for sharing your story and thank you for sharing the really incredible origin story of the Say Gay Plays project. We're so lucky to have your ad advocacy efforts behind this initiative. I'm now going to turn it over to Lisa Rothi, uh, who is going to tell us about the kickoff event that took place at NYU Skirball last month. Lisa? Hi, hi everyone. So grateful to be here. Um, so on May 13th uh, of this year, 2024, uh, Segley Plays launched at the NYU Skirball Center in New York. And we performed for an audience of almost 100 and premiered the 10 short plays with both established and up and coming queer playwrights, um, spanning a really wide tapestry of identities and experiences. Um, in terms of the selection process, uh, initially the advisory board offered names of playwrights we either knew, had worked with, admired, um, and then Wayne reached out to invite them to participate and commissioned them to write a 10 minute play. And once the playwrights were signed on and the plays were written, um, we scheduled development roundtables, uh, uh, roundtable readings on Zoom with uh, some brilliant actors and directors to give the playwrights an opportunity to hear their plays out loud and to develop them further before the event. So I'd like to also just give a shout out to the wonderful actors um, and directors who helped us develop these plays also on those Zoom calls. Um, so uh, we had the plays, the 10 plays that were chosen, you can see them also on the website. Um, uh, but plays by Harvey Stone, Fernanda Koppel, uh, Marquise Gibson, uh, Nina Key, Ty Defoe, Harrison David Rivers, Derek Edgren, Otero, Lucy Thurber, Doug Wright, and Mushuk Mushtaq Dean. And it was a pretty amazing night. It was a little, um, it was really pretty intense as we put it all together for the first time. <laughs> um, but the night was really filled with a lot of great stories and performances. Uh, and we were really honored to have the talented drag performer and actor Peppermint as our host, um, who really came in with uh, extraordinary energy and a really great outfit. Um, so, and there were special appearances by uh, drag performer Yua Hamas Hamasaki. And we were also jo joined by um, the brilliant comedian and performers, Murray Hill and Jeff Hiller, who also presented the first ever Say Gay Plays Award. Um, two of those 10 playwrights, and we'll hear about this a little later, were commissioned, were selected from the Kennedy Center's American College Theater Festival, uh, Har J. Harvey Stone and Derek Edgar Otero, who were chosen to participate in this event and join the first ever catalog of Say Gay Plays. Um, and in terms of the fundraising aspect of this event, uh, Say Gay Plays launched the launch. It served as a benefit for our partner organization, New Alternatives, uh, and they work with homeless LGBTQ plus youth. And in attendance at that event, uh, representing New Alternatives was their founder, Kate Barnhart, who received a special shout out for all the wonderful work she and the organization, organization does for queer youth. Um, and 
you can find out more information uh, on the website about all the plays. I know you'll hear more about this later, but it was a it was a really extraordinary event of community coming together to support each other at in this particular time, um, and to support new alternatives. And you know, really hoping that this is a kickoff for uh, future. Uh, presentations, fundraising events all over the country, theaters, universities. Um, and I'm currently also teaching at uh, uh, Binghamton University, and there will be a, a reading um, in the fall, this fall, uh, before the election. So I think that's all I have to share right now. Thank you so much, Lisa. Wonderful to get a little more uh, context about the evening and the kickoff <laughs> that um, launched this very exciting and important movement of plays across the country. Um, so the New Alternatives fundraiser was a really integral part of that uh, Skirball event. And there is a deep hope that as these plays travel across the country in the many different forms that they may take, which we'll hear more about different ways to produce and present these plays, um, that there can be further fundraising efforts for the LGBTQ community across the country for different nonprofits and community organizations that are already doing deeply important work embedded within local communities. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to now pass it to Kathleen Salazar, who's going to share a little bit more about the fundraiser and then also demonstrate um, how to navigate the Say Gay Plays website, which we'll drop in the chat. That's also uh, featured on this event page on HowlRound um, for more information about how to access these plays. Kathleen? Thank you so much, Amelia. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathleen Salazar. I am the Associate Artistic Director of Voyage Theater Company, as well as one of the co-founders of Say Gay Plays. Um, as we just mentioned, the kickoff event for the Say Gay Plays was also used as a fundraiser for New Alternatives, which does some really wonderful work. We really encourage you to also check out what they do on their website at New Alternatives. Um, and what this event was in service of was to launch this second phase and kind of what me and Wayne wanted to have this project turn into, which is an educational tool, a tool for theater activism. When Wayne and I discussed this project, there was great potential for these plays to be in service of a larger purpose as opposed to just a one night event that could raise money. Um, so we tried to model the first event as something that we hope that future events could happen. Um, like Amelia said, what I'm going to do is walk everyone through a process and uh, really what we hope this conversation serves as a call to action to invite all of you and people around the country to utilize these plays for what they can be used for. Um, so um, now that we have gone through kind of the initial event of what Say Gay Plays was, I'm going to show the website here. Um, and I'm going to give a little bit of context of kind of some of the hope and the goals that we have for what the catalog uh, can do for people around the country. Uh, something that Wayne and I really wanted and the, and the rest of the board wanted to have was this uh, ac accessible form of activism. And we went back and forth on how that could go about, and we knew that we had these to have these plays be royalty free, um, because in order for us to have these tools be available for everyone, they had to be something that there was no barriers put up. And with that in mind, we want we wanted to have this goal of having this first year be pushing towards having up to a hundred productions in all types of forms of the Say Gay plays. Um, one of the big aspects that we also talked about when we were thinking about how to get these plays out was something that Wayne touched on in the beginning, 
this idea of access and education, especially for people who are younger, um, queer youth. Um, and so one of the big focal points of the Sege Plays catalog was getting it into places like universities and schools, uh, because the, like Wayne said, the only way that we can destigmatize some of the narratives and reclaim our narratives is to start with the conversation and making it accessible to young people so that they are not afraid or scared and they feel like they have a way of figuring out things and learning about things for themselves and in a safe environment. Um, so I'm going to jump to the website here uh, and show just how you can use these plays. Um, there is a whole process uh, that you can go through to actually acquire the catalog and we've tried to make it as easy as possible. Um, so I will share my screen here. So when you log on to the Sege Plays website, the first thing you'll be met with is our homepage with this lovely video of some different clips of our initial show, as well as some beautiful clips of some pride marches. And if you scroll down, you'll see our initial message about what we want Say Gay Place to be, which is a movement. We want it to be a tool. Um, we have some more information about the discussion happening today, as well as uh, learning more about the plays and the playwrights themselves. And one of the big things we wanted to do was track the impact of the Say Gay plays. And so we actually made a map that we're hoping to fill up with as many places as possible and track not only where the plays are being done, but how much money is being raised for organization, the different type of collective impact that we can have together. Uh, something that's important to us uh, in tracking our collective impact is visibility. So we have the initial event here, which is the kickoff event that happened at the Skirball. And there's information about the first play uh, of the first event that happened. And then we have the another uh, board member of ours uh, has a, a theater company in Provincetown. So we already have our next uh, pin on the map here. And the, the hope is to have this map be filled with as many pins as possible and make it super colorful and kind of like its own pride map. Um, so in addition to the impact map, before you even think about doing the plays themselves, you can actually go into this tab that tells you a little bit more about the plays, uh, gives you a description of what each play is about, as well as a character breakdown. And then you can also learn about the playwrights themselves. Um, so I will take us back up here. And now you've, if you've gone through the website, if you've looked at, if you've watched this conversation, you've gotten interested about the plays uh, and you want to do them yourself. Uh, so you go down to this tab that has a join Sege plays and this gives you a brief overview of everything you need to know before even applying. Um, there are a few different ways of applying uh, there's about there's two different avenues here. There's ones for actual small nonprofit theater companies uh, and community organizations, and then there's an educational route. Um, and these two big sort of branches kind of uh, go off in their own direction with the same um, same exact process. Uh, but with a theater company there are a few things that you will need to have ahead of time and we list those out for you as well as things you might need to have ahead of time if you're a school and this gives a brief overview of what you need initially but if you have more questions about things that you're curious about in terms of accessing the plays we also have this faq page that answers more about what the say gay plays are who can perform them how do you read the plays you know, all, all the different types of forms of questions that might happen. Um, so we'll jump back to the Join Say Gay Plays. And we tried to make the form as simple as possible. 
one of the biggest things we wanted to do was have this um, this way to track uh, in terms of not just the impact map, but we wanted to have a, a way to track with each place that is doing this. So once you fill out the application, you get a response from us of we've gotten your application, you're approved, and then we will send you a letter of agreement. And once you fill out the letter of agreement, you get that back, you will get all the plays and you will get a packet that will be that is a toolkit for you. Um, and once you have signed the letter of agreement, we go ahead and we put your pin on the map and you'll already be able to see your event on here. And some of the things that we offer in the toolkit to you are the plays themselves. We offer different assets from the initial Sege plays launch event, um, like different projections that were used, different sound cues that were used. Uh, we also offer different educational resources for the plays themselves in presenting these, because one of the big things we want to have is uh, conversations. And so we have a packet in there that helps educators talk about how to facilitate safe spaces for queer youth when doing these plays. We also have a packet in there that talks about how to hold a uh, talk back, how to hold a discussion about these plays. Um, and one of the big things that we're hoping when people do these uh, events is that they will use them for something greater than just to present the plays themselves. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. Um, one of the things that we are hoping for these plays is that people will use them for different events, much like we did. That was one example of how you could model the Sege plays. We give examples in the toolkit as well of how you could use these plays in your community. Uh, we really want these to be things that are like Wayne said, community unifying events. Uh, so these could be anything like using the plays to have a discussion. If you're a college group, ha you know, having a round table discussion, you could use the plays if you wanted to do a produced event as a fundraiser for a local LGBTQ community organization. Um, another thing you could use them for is a voter registration event. Um, there is a big election coming up. Uh, so that is another aspect, but something that we encourage is people to really think about a way that when they take these plays and they decide to do one or three or all of them, um, a way to give back to their community as well, because really the impact that we're trying to have, in addition to just whether there's money being raised, whether there's a registration event being involved, is this idea of community unifying and conversations being had. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about it, like I said, there's more information on our website about how to get started. Um, but I, for now, I'm going to pass it back to Amelia. And I think she's going to take us to the next part. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was so helpful. And I just am obsessed with that website. It is gorgeous <laughs> um, and such a great resource to get folks excited about this movement and to give them more information about the plays and all of the creative ways that they can be adapted to fit different communities' needs. Um, that resource packet that Kathleen was talking about, um, I have taken a look at and it is an invaluable tool um, for educators and other community leaders across the country to really figure out how to meaningfully integrate these plays into the work that your organization or your university or your theater company is already doing. Um, it's just really a, a wealth of resources that comes along with these royalty free plays. Um, and I don't know if anyone has said this yet, but I just want to throw out there as well that part of the um, really exciting challenge that has been um, posited by Voyage Theater Company is that there is a hope that there will be 100 productions or readings or um, just uh, versions of the Say Gay plays available across the country this year. So we've had the big kickoff event. We know we've got the one scheduled in Provincetown later this year, as well as the reading at Binghamton University that Lisa mentioned. Um, so that leaves the door wide open for everyone else to get on that map. 
Um, so I am now going to pass it to Gary Garrison, who is the managing director of Provincetown Playhouse. And he is also uh, a Say Gay Plays advisory board member. And Gary, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about the partnership with the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival um, in an effort to include both emerging and established playwrights. I know that was a really essential part of um, creating the roster by having two emerging playwrights through that, um, through that festival included in these. So I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Gary. You're welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Gary. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I came to the Say Gay Plays, um, as mentioned, as the managing director of the Provincetown Theater. It's it's not the Provincetown Playhouse, everybody, just so you know, because that, that is actually in Manhattan and it has a whole other group of people around it. So very common uh, that those names are transposed. Anyway, I came as the managing director of the Provincetown Theater. And as we began to talk about what the shape of the project would be, and who would be involved as playwrights in the project, I knew that my experience with the Kennedy Center and the American College Theater Festival, the acronym is KCACTF, might be helpful. So uh, just to give you a, a, just a small point of information, KCACTF, the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival, is sponsored by the Department of Education through our federal government and the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And, and what KCACTF does, and does beautifully, is that they gather artists from colleges and universities, almost, almost 3,000 in number, from all across the country to celebrate creating theater in eight regional festivals by focusing on the crafts of acting and directing and lighting, sound, and costume design, playwriting, management, criticism, and on. So all these college kids and university kids from all over the country kind of come together in these, these um, regional festival events. And they, they see new productions, they see new plays, they hear readings, they, they have acting awards and directing, just the whole kind of uh, spectrum of all kinds of things that are about making theater. Um, what then happens is in April of every year, a lot of those students come to Washington, D.C. for a national festival to continue that celebration of collaboration and each other's craft. Uh, the alliance with KCACTF and the Sege Plays, it seemed uh, a natural thing because it would guarantee that there was a presence of young burgeoning playwrights as part of the event. And as said earlier, uh, this year, it was Jay Harvey Stone from Holland's University uh, Playwrights Lab in Holland's uh, in Virginia, and uh, Derek Edgren Otero from Iowa Playwrights Workshop. Both of those gentlemen are MFA uh, candidates. And they were chosen from that national festival to be a part of the Say Gay Plays. Uh, Greg Henry, who is the artistic director of KCACTF, has made a commitment both programmatically and financially to involve young playwrights with the Say Gay Plays in every way possible with the project. And we couldn't be more thrilled. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, love to hear that. And um, I also just want to say to spread the spirit of uh, young and emerging playwrights, we also want to encourage local playwrights to write their own plays to be part of the Say Gay Plays movement that could be presented in conjunction with these 10 plays from the catalog. Um, so very exciting. Lots, lots of opportunities to call people into this theatrical conversation. Um, at this time, I am going to pivot to Tyrone Henderson, who is the artistic director of Quicksilver Theater Company and another Say Gay Plays advisory board member, and ask Tyrone and Gary as well, um, as artistic slash managing directors of independent theater companies, um, as well as in Tyrone's case, somebody who is teaching theater at the university level, what do you see as the advantage of producing these plays? And what might some of the challenges be? Tyrone, why don't you start us off? 
Sure. Hey, everybody. My name is Tyrone Mitchell Henderson. I am the founder artistic producer of Quicksilver Theater Company, and I serve on the advisory board of the Sege Plays. As part of the New York City Sege Play event at the Skirball, I directed Harrison David Rivers. I love the SHIT out of you, which was a monologue. Um, and uh, additionally, I do teach at three different institutions. I teach at NYU Stella Adler Studio, I teach at Montclair State University, and I teach at the Black Arts Institute. And as for challenges, uh, it may be trying to get a buy-in from the heads of the institutions and department heads, but I'm a great talker into kind of advocate for the, in these circumstances. And the Sege plays put a fire in my belly. I got the first yes from a playwright to participate in the New York event. My mode to approach continues with heads of departments, affinity groups, student-led organizations. I'm also interested in how we expand the catalog of plays. Um, QSTC, or Quicksilver Theater Company, is also a community partner at the Dramatist Guild Foundation, and there are a great number of opportunities for playwrights and composers to just go and write and compose uh, at the Dramatist Guild Foundation. Uh, their website is dgf.org. And if you're a writer and a composer, uh, encouraged to write, we encourage you to write plays for your local events. One of my dreams is the expansion of Sege Plays. So jump into the FAQ page that Kathleen mentioned and let's continue to Sege. <laughs> Gary? Hi, everybody. Hi again. Uh, so Promise Town Theater has a, a unique geographic location. We're in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And if you're familiar with our, our town, you know that a good majority of our population is uh, LGBTQ plus IA. Um, and so, you know, we live in an environment where it is a part of our daily lives that we're talking to one another, seeing one another, sharing stories, sharing ideas, challenging values, uh, beliefs, uh, and the like. So it's certainly important to me, and I know uh, the artistic director of the theater, David uh, Drake, as well, that, we, that we're all talking about what's on the collective minds of people, not just in our town, because this is a very rarefied culture, but in, in places all across the country, if not the world. So one of the reasons why we wanted to be a part of this was to bring that kind of diversity of voice and also the kind of collective thinking and thought behind this crazy political situation in Florida and how can we be a part of that conversation? And what can we do? And how can we inspire others to take an action? So this just seems um, like a perfect fit for us. Uh, so we are having an evening of the Sege Plays on September 19th, much like they did in New York, um, where we'll be choosing some of the plays to be read um, and celebrating this extraordinary achievement by Voyage and, and everybody associated with the project. Um, it's really important to us to uh, stay in the front of the conversation or a part of, be, certainly be a part of the conversation um, and, to, and to discover how that affects the politics in our own state um, and then certainly those around us. And, and of course, we're coming into a... a we're coming into a crazier time. So hopefully, uh, with the election coming up, so hopefully this will give us guidance of how to help each other through. All right, thanks. Love it. Thank you so much. Um, I would now like to turn it over to Mashuk Mushtaq Dean, who was one of the playwrights for the Say Gay Plays project. And uh, my first question for you is, why did, why did you say yes to this when you were invited to participate? Um, I've got two, uh, two answers to that. One is, it's, it's been a while since I've been in a queer space um, in this way, and I missed it. I used to do some community organizing, and then I was in those spaces all the time. And then I really focused on my career, um, and the spaces just didn't happen quite as often. So 
partly it's just really nice to to feel that again. And then the others is that Jamil asked, and I saw Lisa on the list, and I think in theater where no one's paid really anything often, it's like when a friend asks you to do something, you're like, sure, what do you need? And so that's that's also why I said yes. Awesome, thank you. Um, and what would you say were some of the challenges of this project? Yeah, um, I think for me, I when I first got the request, I I sort of went, uh oh, I I think they want a PSA. I don't write PSAs, and that's probably not what they wanted at all. But that's where my head went, and I I think our culture is so divided and didactic that I was like, oh, you want to tell me. I'm supposed to tell people why you're not supposed to be mean to gay people or something like that's what my play is supposed to be about and I don't want to write that play. Um, but uh, I think the challenge in writing a play like this is how do you weave everyone in and find a compassionate way to um, allow everyone to feel a little vulnerable in a and sort of embrace a, a more national conversation so that everyone has a place to start if to be together and to me it's like how do you bridge that didactic argument that everyone's having and say hey we're all humans and it's all pretty scary and let's all be scared together um and that's okay like that's okay to do that and so um that was one of the challenges and then to explain the second challenge i think we'll play the video next and then i can tell you a little bit about the second challenge is it the journey or the goal if theater is about the human struggle, why does it seem like we prize getting it right over mucking around in the mess? Why, why is this mucking so messy? Why does it feel so messy? Why do we sometimes feel bad about ourselves when we're covered in muck? But what is this muck that he keeps talking about? Can I be a good person even if I'm covered in muck? Who decides if we are good people? people? Who is the martyr of good and not good enough? When I'm alone in the dark night of my soul and I wonder whether I'm good enough, who will send an answer that I am able to hear? Again, Again one, one must ask, why do you never talk about God? Great. So I I think that clip one is, I think, shows a little bit of my ethos of we get it wrong a lot and things are hard and life is messy and how do you embrace that part of it? Um, but I think the other challenge is I wrote a choral piece and it is really impossible to rehearse a choral piece over Zoom. So Lisa and I had to do kind of like a fly by the seat of our pants. We will rehearse it day of and make it work and somehow we'll bring in every actor from all the other pieces who are busy juggling their other, you know, so there was just like practicalities that were um, fun challenges, I would say, to to see. And and I think the unexpectedness of theater is like, it's live, we're gonna see what happens. And there was a lot of that fun in the evening too. You can really, you can feel it from that, just that short little clip. I'm glad we were able to see a section of it live. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, my last question, which I'll um, pose to you, but then maybe we can open it up to a broader conversation, is around casting, um, thinking about bringing these plays across the country. Um, who, who can produce your play? And how, how specific are the casting requirements, um, which might be a limitation for some companies or not? Um, anyone with a good heart can produce my play, <laughs> or all these plays, I would assume. Um, and uh, use it for good and not for evil. Um, and I guess I, for me and every playwright is is kind of different, but I have the way I've, so it's a choral piece, which means three to as many people as you want can perform it. Of those three people, one person should be transgender and one person should not appear to be um, non-binary. And that's sort of the, the make of it, but it depends where you are. And and for me personally, I feel like if you're somewhere where like it's a room of um, 50 lesbians and they're doing this for each other and this is their show, then I'm gonna be like, just say, for me, I would say, just say something that says normally we would, we would have this character in the play, but we don't have it in this group. So just know that this is a part of the mix when you hear the play. For me, that's good enough. I, I can't speak for other playwrights, but I think good intentions mean a lot 
um, and you do the best you can sometimes. Definitely. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so at this point, um, we are going to open it up to a broader conversation with all the panelists. And for our audience members, um, I just want to say that we're going to be taking your questions very shortly. So now is a great time to drop those in the chat if you have any questions for the panel. Um, but perhaps um, continuing that casting conversation or anything else that's bubbled up for the panelists while you've been listening to each other speak, um, what's on people's minds? What else do we want to um, add to this conversation? I'll jump, I'll jump back in. Um, so I think, you know, part of what we were trying to um, calculate when we were putting together this portfolio of plays was that there are enough plays here that almost anybody can select two or three or four or five plays that will work for their community almost no matter what the demographic of your community is. There are plays for young people. Um, there are plays for people of a very wide spectrum of racial profiles and cultural backgrounds. Um, so there's plenty to choose from here. Um, presenters should not feel that they need to present all 10 plays. We did it in New York because we were kicking off the event, but it's a lot and I would, um, I, I don't expect anybody else to do that. I would say choose those plays that you think will speak best to your community, that you're able to, uh, to cast with the folks that you have and, um, and don't let any sort of casting limitations be the thing that prevents you from, from going forward with producing these. That's great. Thank you, um, Wayne. I, Kathleen, I mean, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I can, I can jump in. I, I think something else, um, just hearing a, about uh, Dean speak about his piece is, I think one of the big things that uh, we're hopeful for with these plays is, is this opportunity for education. I think access to information and access to stories about people that are in your community that you might not know are in your community or or you know or that you you are a part of community and you don't have that where you are i think that that was something that was very important to us was the the ability for people to even just read these um in in community settings is so important um because the the starting of a conversation can be so hard and I think, you know, what that clip of Dean's play really does well is is um, talk about our uh, struggle to begin with with something. And and I think with these plays, we hope for a beginning from uh, of a col of this like collective community conversation um, with places that you know it 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 isn't just. Florida. I think like it's easy to focus on the sort of specific places that we've heard, you know, big outrageous bills from, but it's but it's all over the place, you know, it's in New York, it's in California, it's it's in, you know, some of the places that we think of as these uh, liberal open minded havens. And I think that that is like a really important part too is is us to coming together to to talk about where those are in our communities and bring, bringing in people from all places as well. Um, I think Dean wants to jump in here. Well, what, you, just, you reminded me, and I just wanted to um, add on to that, that, um, that like we're not a monolithic, the queer community is not this monolithic community either. Like we're so diverse, we have so much, um, we understand and also we're learning to, you know, trying to understand about each other. and. I remember talking with Lisa at the at the Skirball Center that I don't really think there is an us in them. And like there there's a lot of the media and like it's good for ratings for there to be an us in them. But just like we are monolithic, so are the people that are struggling to understand us a bit monolithic. And what if we could just, you know, embrace that somehow? And I hope these plays do that. I think that would be a great, a great thing. 
I just wanted to add something to uh, what Dean said. I, I so appreciate what he said about who can do his play. Because when we decided to do the Sege plays here in September, um, I called Wayne and, and Kathleen and I, I was a little panicked because we are a fairly, we're, we don't have a lot of diversity in our community here. And and I, you know, and how well can we do these plays, or should we be doing these plays, or which of the plays can we do, or you know, like all those questions. And they assured me. I love that Dean said, "If you have a heart, you can do it," because I think that is the guide that let that guide us through. And then certainly, you know, there are some plays that we just won't do, can't do, shouldn't do. And and I think by explaining, uh, like with, as Dean said in his his situation in his play, I think that that solves that issue for everybody. Anyway, I just wanted to offer that. Yeah, and if I may, I, you know, I I found that uh, in directing Harrison's piece, a, a lot of what came to the fore was what is love, and. I do find, you know, after having witnessed it at the Skirball, that there was a lot of conversation about how we love, who we love, and why we love. And that really spoke to me um, when you look at the, the, the pieces as a whole, it, the resounding word was love. And that was really, really joyous to experience at the Skirball. And I think wherever, you know, uh, the, the pieces go or whoever creates the next new work, I think the continued conversation is, is yes, say gay, but also, and, 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 and in, adi in addition, how do you express your love? That's beautiful. Thank you, Tyrone. Lisa. We can't hear you. You'd think after four years of doing this, right? We would have it down. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add too that, you know, hosting some readings um, can be really simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, you know, you can, you know, having ideas for community outreach, you can cast people who, you know, you can cast your neighbors, you can do it in a backyard, you can cast, you know, local celebrities, you can cast people that would love the opportunity to be an activist, right? You can spread the word. Um, and you can make contact with local representatives of your chosen not-for-profit. You can invite them to get involved. Like there are just different ways to do that. And that it's really about your participation in your this event being vital to this kind of national movement, even if your publicity efforts are minimal too. I mean, there's something about just not letting the fear of PR stopping you from producing a reading. And it's a hundred percent useful and meaningful to do a small reading. And you know, um, just that the collective energy of these readings, we want to, you know, wanting to have a hundred um, of these readings or more all over the country, but that the collective energy of these readings all over this country will be felt. Um, so you have time to do this. We support you, you know, and if there's anything that we can do to, to help you, you know, think about it or, you know, um, make this happen, uh, happy to help and support you. So that's such a great, um, reminder, Lisa. Thank you. It can just to Kathleen's point as well, it can feel very intimidating to start. Right. And whether that's the casting process or, um, just what it looks like to produce something, um, it doesn't have to be as much of a hurdle as we might make it up to be in our minds. 
Um, and we do, we have a question um, from our audience. Thank you, Jess, um, which is what are some other takeaways from the Skirball event that you'd pass on to other would-be producers, which is a great segue exactly to what you were just speaking about, Lisa. Um, Wayne, I'll pass that to you, but if anyone else also wants to hop in with um, some takeaways for would-be producers, please, we're all ears. So, that's a great question. Hi, Jess. Thank you so much for that. Um, we set a high bar for uh, producing Sege plays because we were kicking this thing off. Um, it was the first time it was being done. It was the first time it was being done in New York. We wanted to do big, like a big splashy kind of event. And so we found a, a big venue and we shot for the moon because Moises told me to dream big. We, we were dreaming big and um, we were lucky enough to have um, a lot of people along the way keep saying yes to our asks. When we were asked for things, people just kept saying yes. And um, I, I, I'm just so grateful for that. It was just, um, for example, uh, I noticed in our, our audience today is Robert Sutherland Cohen, who was a professor of mine at Brooklyn College. He was my stage management um, uh, professor. And uh, casually over dinner, we happened to mention Say Gay Plays to Robert. And Robert said, what can I do to help? I'm in. And he came on board and brought his 40 plus years of experience stage managing on Broadway to bear on what we were doing at the Skirball Center and was able to run the backstage and connect all the microphones and make it all happen seamlessly in a way that I wasn't even thinking about. It wasn't even something I knew we needed, but we desperately needed. And so that's just another example of how when you when you take a small action and you say, I you, you set an, inten an intention to do something, people will say yes and people and doors will start to open and you invite people in and you build community that way um I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um this is such a calling in project and um I want to ask, I think we have just time for this one last question which is a great one um which is for anybody. Can you discuss how subversive humor is used in some of these pieces and how humor functions in queer slash gay plays? Is it changing? I don't know who wants to take that on, but I think that's a really great question. Um, I can I can speak a little bit on this. I, I know one of our pieces uh, that comes to mind is a piece by one of our Kennedy Center playwrights. Um, uh was called diet pride and it was uh a, a imagining scenario uh about what it would look like in a big corporation if something uh happened to get out on twitter of someone saying uh a slur about queer people and it was this whole sort of um comedic uh um, work office environment uh, of and and the playwright Derek sort of spoke about it of like you know what would it be like to try and you know would a corporation be able to get away with something like this could anything really happen and I think that that piece what it did so well was uh, take something that is very hurtful is something that is very uh, very much happens a lot of the time where you just see companies getting away with being able to do whatever they want but and seemingly no repercussions but again like this idea of like reclaiming it to be used as humor and a healing process i think some of the things that queer people are really good about doing with their theater and with their art is and not just queer people but i i want to speak kind of to how Dean spoke as well of, of just sort of people who, uh, you know, in any marginalized communities, I think what we do to combat some of the narrative is use humor as a, a, a healer as well. And I think allowing space for people to use humor, even in, in its extreme forms, uh, 
as a healer is so important in both like a, a grieving process of acknowledging the hurt that can happen, um, but also using it to to start the the ways of like, yeah, how, you know, how do we get through the days where it just seems like anybody can say anything to us? Um, and some of that is using the the joy of, you know, this this play used it as a, a way to make a lot of people laugh uh, um, at a very outrageous scenario. Um, and I, I, I really, you know, I think that was one of the plays that sticks out in my mind of like, there just was a such a clear intention of words are powerful and also they don't, they, how do we, how do we take them back for ourselves? Uh, and I think Lisa also has a, a, something else to say on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna jump in really quickly just to say um, I that there are also two places, um, a principal's office by Fernanda Koppel also, who wrote a piece about a lesbian Latinx mom confronting another parent's bigotry at her school, which um, I love the way that starts. Um, there's a lot of humor in that, and I think a recognizable um, connection to both of those characters. Um, and um, Kathleen, I just really want to thank you for bringing in the concept of healing into this space. Um, and that, you know, I think that also queer people have like lived in subvers subversive spaces for ever because we've had to. Um, right? Like going, you know, under the radar of um, society and culture. And so humor is really extraordinary. You know, it's an incredible tool um, to hook you in also. And, you know, and Doug Wright, an address to the Florida legislator, I think is a really brilliant way of expressing that. Um, I also just wanted to um, just the last thing I wanted to say too was, and not that this is about humor necessarily, but I wanted to um, just cite the fact that yesterday was the second anniversary of the Dobbs decision, and um, to, you know, the 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 source of that and and how we're using um, theater and art to move forward and to hopefully move legislation forward. Um, but also just to collectively communicate, you know, gather as a community um, for love and support among each other. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. So many beautiful things we could talk much more at length about, but at, for the time being, I'm going to turn it over to Wayne, who has some closing remarks for us, and then I'll, I'll close this out. Wayne. Um, wow, thank you all so much. I'm, I'm so grateful to everyone who's been on this panel today. You've been supporting this project throughout and I'm just, I thank you th from the bottom of my heart. I just wanna add that a reminder that, you know, Sege Plays is an invitation to engage in theater as activism, but it's also about artists giving back. You know, and I hear a lot of talk these days about how theaters are broke nobody has any money, audiences haven't come back. That's been the conversation um, for a while now. And I think the antidote to scarcity, the scarcity mindset is giving back. Do something for somebody else, help them achieve their goals and it will give back to you. Let's change the narrative from scarcity to abundance through giving back to your community. You will engender goodwill, you will find new audience members, make new friends and allies, and you'll be a hero. Oh, and remember, this is fun. Uh, it, it, it's supposed to be fun. So bring some actors together, make a night of readings. It's not that hard. And you could be a part of making a difference collectively across the country. So thank you. Thank you, Wayne. I know I am leaving today's conversation feeling very inspired and invigorated to get out there and say gay. 
I hope that the rest of our audience members are as well. Uh, thank you so much to our brilliant panelists for all of your contributions. Thank you to our audience for watching and listening. And thank you in advance to all of you for participating in Say Gay Plays uh, in staging readings and productions across the country this year. I know you're just burning to get in there. Um, as a reminder, you can learn more and join the movement at saygayplays.org. I'll drop that in the chat one more time. And I just wanted to say happy pride, y'all. Thanks again. Bye.